and welcome to a new episode and new season of the Computomics podcast. My guest today is a consultant in strategy and innovation in plant science and breeding consultant at Computomics and for other organizations. Her work history spans over 25 years, a vast geographic region, Europe, the Middle East, South America, and she has worked as a commercial plant breeder, as a project leader in global sustainable cocoa sourcing, as head of a research institute specializing in perfume and medicinal plants, and as a freelance advisor and strategist. Anne Buchwalder, welcome to the Computomics podcast. Thank you. As a, as a start, I, I know you've, uh, you speak four languages, you've traveled a lot, you've worked in a lot of different places. Do you have a favorite spot to spend some time? Any recommendations? Any recommendation? That's quite hard eh? because <laughs> there are so many nice places around the globe. Uh, so, but there are each of them have specificity. And what I really uh, enjoy more is uh, sharing the everyday life of people and meeting with uh, people in different countries. And that's what that's what I really enjoy traveling around the globe for uh, job purposes. And that's something that I really appreciate. So, uh, of course, I, I had lived in Turkey for almost six years. And this is a place that I really love because uh, Turkish people are really friendly and welcome uh, foreigners. Uh, but of course, I also enjoyed a lot uh, South America uh, for their also way of living and the food and their habits as well. Uh, Southeast Asia is also a fascinating place. Um, Central Africa, where I travel a lot for cocoa, it's also a fascinating place. So, yeah, there are each of them a specificity. I understand. I realize that I really not answer your question sharply, but this is a broad um, panorama of where you can go for summer holiday, for example. Yeah, as a fellow lover of travel, I can totally understand where you're coming from. It's it's hard to pick a favorite or even. Yeah, with, with that many great experiences and places and, and people, how can yeah. you can you pick just one, right? Absolutely. Um, and really sharing the everyday life of people, sharing their habits, discussing with them. That's really what I really appreciate more in uh, traveling. Definitely. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, as you've mentioned and I've mentioned, you have worked in a lot of different places. Um, can you can you maybe give us a quick uh, uh, insight into the primary crops that you've worked with in these different places? OK, so I started working on plant breeding as a commercial plant breeder uh, for at that time. It was the, the, the company named Seminis. Afterwards, it was bought by Monsanto and today Bayer. So I started uh, pea as a commercial uh, pea breeder uh, for processing peas uh, for a market dedicated on uh, uh, Europe. So that's how I started and uh, learned how to transfer from the theory learned at school to the real, the real world, let's say. And then afterwards, I moved on to um, a special melon consumed in France, a Charente. It's a cantaloupe, but with a specific uh, aroma, texture, and sugar and shape and sugar contents. So this is a really French market, uh, but really interesting uh, crop as well. And then afterwards, I move on uh, sweet and hot pepper, working in Turkey. Uh, and afterwards, uh, I uh, I worked on breeding cocoa. So this is the panorama where of um, the different uh, breeding program I worked on. Yeah, that's that's also quite a quite a range. I was also wondering about the perfume and medicinal plants because you you did develop an R and D strategy uh, in that area as well, right? Absolutely. So I I haven't mentioned it earlier just because I did not on this on this um, position I did not directly work on breed, plant breeding. Mm -hmm. I manage a team of people working on these topics, of course, but th this is a very fascinating word and there is a lot of potential as well. Um, so just imagine that the medicinal and perfume plant that we use in Europe are imported for more than 80% of them. Mm -hmm. So we rely on, ex on importation from different countries, the quality, the standard, the way it is grown, it's not always uh, sustainable, of course. Mm -hmm. And so that's where uh, there is a huge potential uh, to improve the sustainable production of these uh, plants 
and uh, there is a very high interest today in different countries and I get that uh, in Germany is the same as in France or in Netherlands it is all, we are all more and more concerned about our environmental footprint mm -hmm. first of all and the second part is that we are more and more concerned on having more natural uh, stuff having more clean labels all these kind of uh, topics and so that's where this group of plants has a huge potential for sure. And you've, you've already mentioned sustainability. That's definitely something I want to go into because a lot of your work has been focused in, in that area with the uh, Nestle Cocoa program as well, I think. Um, how, what would you say, I mean, what are the main challenges with regard to vegetable breeding huh. that you've Ve encountered? Vegetable breeding and uh, sustainability, that's a huge question indeed. And um, so today, uh, in, in Europe, for instance, uh, in winter crop, the problem is that we really depend on importation when it is winter. And we, we, in the past decades, we have been trained to have fruit and vegetable all year round, mm. uh, which is not exactly the normality or the naturality, let's say. And so we have been trained and we have been, we have been grown with this luxury, let's say. And we have no to change our habits as a consumer to change the way it is grown, uh, because if there is no market, there will be there will there will be no longer uh, the production overseas. So that's a big challenge. But at the end, but to the other hand, you have people uh, at the other part of the globe. So if, so if you look at uh, a growing banana or uh, there are many countries depending on the economy of selling these fruits when we do not have fresh fruits in Europe when it is winter. So this is the wall. So it's not an easy, um, easy issue to solve because you have to consider the, 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 the country and the economy of these growing countries that rely for a certain part of their, um, their income. They really rely on this exportation. But to the other end, we also have to change our habits and consumptions. So that's why, uh, first of all, I do think, and I am, I am a, a strong activist on that, uh, raising the awareness, awareness on people uh, just to think about their consumption. And then I do think that everybody will find their way, their own way to, make, to be more sustainable. Your way of being more sustainable can be completely different from my way. But at the end of the day, we have to reduce our footprint. That's true. But I think you, you, you touched on a very important point, the kind of the nexus between the desire to become more sustainable, the desire to become more environmentally friendly, and at the same time, or on the other hand, the, the, the potential economic impact of, of these changes. Um, so I'm wondering, especially as a, as a strategist and as someone who's, who's worked with people on site where the actual breeding happens, where the where the vegetables are produced or the, the different products. Um, like what what can be done sustainability wise on on that end? So if the expectation of the consumers change, if we actually manage to to make people think about season seasonality and all these things, uh, how what can we do on the other side, on the production side to to make the entire uh, production, I guess, more more sustainable? Yeah, exactly. If you look at um, a country that I, I, I worked with and I know a little bit is a country like Ivory Coast, or if you go also another country, I, I, I traveled a lot for work, it was Ecuador. So these two countries export a, a huge amount of um, agricultural production abroad. Okay, mm -hmm. so their economy really relies on this a big part. If you look at cocoa, cocoa, I think for Cote d'Ivoire, uh, uh, accounts for about um, forty percent of the, the 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 growth of the country. So that's really good. Mm -hmm. But to the, and at, and at the other end, hardly almost no people in Cote d'Ivoire have eaten a bar, a chocolate bar. Okay. Mm. So this is tr really, truly a commodity crop for the consumer, and this is a, a cash crop for the producer in those countries. So, so how can you change that? It's really mm -hmm. hard. Uh, and so, at the end, to the and at the other hand, 
you have to have more and more local sourcing for cereal, for instance, and how you can introduce cereals adapted to this uh, part of the globe. Uh, how you introduce uh, vegetables that are more adapted to this part of the globe. So they, that's why it's all linked and we cannot say, OK, uh, let's get rid of chocolate or let's get rid of banana. That's not as simple as that. You have to train also and to give other alternative to this kind of producing country to grow locally their cereal they need or the, um, the, 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 the fruit or the vegetable they need to avoid also the importation for their own consumptions. So to be more independent and to have a more sustainable, um, and, um, more sustainable um, source of uh, raw material in a, given area, in a given area of the globe, that would be already something improved <laughs> before saying a, a country maybe a, by geography maybe mm -hmm. yeah that makes sense it's not it's not there's no simple solutions you can't just change one thing and you'll solve the problem right absolutely not and and again if i take the example of cocoa uh it's a very touchy um crop when you discuss about with a country like Ghana or Cote d'Ivoire, because it's such an important crop for their, the, the income of the country. So that's also why you have to work and discuss all the thing with the, those countries, with the politics of this country to build something all together. It's at, at global level. It's not, we cannot say, okay, us in Europe, we're going we're gonna to work on to be more sustainable. No, I think we are all on the same, <laughs> the same planet and, and the solution has to be global, definitely. Mm -hmm. That's why it is so difficult to implement. Yeah, for sure. I, I would be interested to, to have a bit more insight into that actual work, because like you said, you've been in, uh, in Cote d'Ivoire, you've, you've been uh, in Ecuador actually on site uh, doing some of that work, trying to 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 work locally to increase sustainability. Uh, if, if you if you can take us along, like how did you talk with people? What kind of programs did you implement? So in those two countries, in those countries uh, working for Coco, the goal and the the the, um, the vision uh, companies such as Nestle, uh, I work for at that time, has is to improve the growing conditions of this crop which is typically a tropical crop. OK, so and with, it's a food, but it's also it's not a, a basic food. It's a, just a, a treat more than a food, better say. And uh, and so the, the vision of this of the, of the company and every confection, the, every company involved in confectionery businesses is to improve the, the growing conditions of this crop to make it more sustainable, because in the past, uh, they used to have a lot of cutting forest to grow the cocoa, etc. And, and as soon as you you try to understand why uh, people started to cut forest, etc., and, and you realize that it's just because we haven't given them access to good agricultural practices. So that's why not only Nestle but also Mars, Mondelez, every every company is involved in uh, confectionery um, is really concerned about this and try to help uh, the farmers in those um, pr producing countries. Mm -hmm. And what what kind of, uh, I guess, what shape does that help take uh, if, you, if we we're talking concrete? And so exactly, so they have different uh, pillars, let's say. Uh, the, there, the, most of the time there is one pillar linked to society. So it's about um, avoid um, child labor, uh, give access uh, to education, uh, having fair um, price and having um, also involving women because most of the time men and women are, are working in the plantation, but traditionally uh, the, the balance for revenue was not exactly the same. So this is the first pillar most of the time, so, so, so social pillar. Uh, you have a second pillar, which is uh, linked to um, tracking the sourcing, make sure that you, you, you pay the right price, you, you have uh, the, the intermediaries are well connected and there is no, no gap or so that everybody along the value chain is considered and well paid. And the third pillar, which is the pillar I worked on, is about ag agricultural practices and agronomy. And there you can work on um, planting material, 
because you, as soon as you try to understand what's going wrong uh, in producing cocoa, you realize that uh, uh, most of the time you do not have access to improved uh, planting material. Mm -hmm. So that's the first pillar. Then you start also with um, crop management, including fertilizer, crop protection, pruning. Pruning in many countries is not uh, something that is usually adapted and um, so that uh, how you do and also how to harvest and how to ferment and dry in the appropriate way so that's the the whole challenge yeah again a complex system the value chain from, yeah. from farmer to, to customer but um let's dive in because we have you here as the the expert into that into that last pillar um like you said agricultural practices and, and agronomy um what kind of planting material because you said better access or access to improved planting material was one key factor in that pillar of, of increasing sustainability. So what, what would that have been? Or can you, can you speak of specific examples maybe? As so well? it's first of all is to identify the, we have the good, the chance that um, you have in cocoa that you have a good, um, Arizona, good um, di genetic diversity of the, the tree. And then is to, evaluate to assess the potential, the yield potential, the disease resistance of this, um, this diversity in a given environment. And so it, it means that, and, and like any other crop, uh, something, uh, some, an individual that uh, performs well in a given environment will not perform in elsewhere and vice versa. Okay. So first of all, you have to identify this and then you have to propagate it because it's a tree and the problem is that making plantlets it's expensive and most of the time farmers do not have uh, uh, money uh, they cannot afford buying new planting material so that's where all these companies and every uh, action to uh, trying to help uh, the agronomy in the cocoa sector is to give access to this planting material for free or with different mm -hmm. uh, economical system with such as loan or things like that just mm -hmm. because at the first time like any uh, perennial crop you need to invest in the planting material and wait for two three four years before mm -hmm. having revenue so it's quite hard so that's also why in these um, agronomy plans you have, um, so first of all, you give access to improved material, and then you also try during the first two, three years when you do not have a cocoa harvest to, to grow it with other crops such as vegetables or mm. medicinal perfume plants, um, just to give income awaiting for the, the, the cocoa crop for sure. Mm -hmm. And also more and more um, producing systems are based on agroforestry as well. Mm -hmm. Also, for mainly two reasons. First reason is to have income and to buffer the risk of um, collapse in prices. Mm -hmm. And also to for the sustainably sustainable reason, the environmental reason of having more balanced um, ecosystem, not only in the air, but also in the soil. In the soil, so to avoid monocultures and the kind of depletion that, that goes along with that, right? Hmm, interesting. So I, I'm wondering, I mean, obviously, we're in the computomics podcast, so <laughs> um, uh, there have to be questions about tech as well. And especially on on um, on that issue of identifying disease resistant plants um, and providing plant material, planting material that is that is uh, very resistant or that's especially optimized for 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 a region. What role does tech play in that, in that aspect of the work? <laughs> that's uh, and that's really an interesting question and um, a very exciting uh, um, point. Um, you know, and back to Europe. Let's say, <laughs> let's mm -hmm. travel back to Europe. And uh, today uh, we are and with the summer like the one we just have had uh, this year. You, you see how the climate change is getting mm -hmm. uh, hard. Uh, we will have drier periods, we will have hotter periods, we will have uh, EV rainfalls. So all these things are changing and um, we are not uh, ready for that, definitely not. And we have to change our cropping systems. We have to, to also find the plant varieties that are 
adapted or at least that can stand these um, extremes. Mm-hmm. And so that's where uh, working with computer mix and, and um, bridging uh, the technology they have with the plant breed with plant breeding is very fascinating because um, you will need to, to to match more and more the adaptation of these plants with the environment and to predict it and to mm-hmm. to make models that are extreme more extreme than the one that you can experiment. So it means that you can help plant breeders to breed forward, which is something quite new and innovative to my understanding. And uh, that's also why I'm really happy to give my input put as a plant breeder to make it happen and to give a new, a new tool in the hands of plant breeder to, to help them uh, selecting the right planting material for the, 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 the climate that is going to be not the one that we are forecasting, we are uh, re- broadcasting right now, but the one that we are forecasting. Right, right. Look, looking into the future and, and building yeah. what we need before we need it. Exact, exactly. And, and, you know, and also now working with more and more uh, biocontrol, uh, um, biofertilization, uh, boosting uh microbiote of the soil all this and 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 growing a given crop in this environment it's something that everybody is discovering things every day uh, that's a fascinating moment that we are living right now mm-hmm. uh, because uh, we in the past decade we have been used to grow um, wheat or barley uh, we put um, fertilizer, synthetic fertilizer, we put um, um, ke- biochemical uh, chemicals to avoid uh, fungus and pest and disease. Mm-hmm. And everything was well controlled, let's say. Today we say, okay, we want to boost the, the microbiota of the soil to reduce the nitrogen inputs, to avoid the, um, the, the, um, the gas emissions. So, okay, first, then we will spray not with um, chemicals, but we spray with biocontrol, uh, with biostimulants, okay. Mm-hmm. And then all these things we do, the, the variety that you have been growing for many years, or you do not know how it will react in front of this mi- uh, micro environment, which is quite new. Mm. And so that's also where oh, collecting as many as possible data uh, is so crucial to to have a fine understanding on how all these things interact together. Mm-hmm. Right, it's, it's almost learning <laughs> learning from the data that we have right now and using that to simulate into into the future. Um, mm. Exciting. I'm, I'm especially that that point that you made earlier, right? That we have this this I guess challenge. We have that here in Europe where we're based. Uh, as much as as the farmers do in in Ecuador or uh, Cote d'Ivoire, everywhere the climate is changing. Yes, and and we have to to work with with tech ideally to to increase our chances to deal with those challenges, right? But at least the tech will help us to find a solution faster. Mm. Yeah, uh, and and a, and a sustainable solution faster, <laughs> because yeah. in the past. And, but we do not have to blame from the past because we didn't know definitely at that time, but it was easy and we found chemical that controlled the development of pest or, or disease. It was fantastic, to be honest, at that, in the, at that time it was, it was excellent. Yeah, it was, it was a solution for the time, but now we know it wasn't ideal and exactly. now we have to do it differently. Um, but I wonder though, because you, you, I mean, you also worked as a, as a strategist, as someone who develops R&D strategies, who develops tech roadmaps and has developed them. Um, how, or how, how do you go about integrating this tech? Uh, I know you work with computomics, but, but also uh, sp- speaking specifically, but also generally, how, mm-hmm. how can you implement that? How can someone who works in that area implement tech to get faster, to get to those results faster? Exactly. You know, when I started, 25 years ago as a commercial plant breeding breeder, uh, I used to present my job with all the different um, toolbox that I had in my hands. And at that time it was okay, the emerging uh, impact of molecular biology, 
plant, plant pathology, plant cell culture, mm -hmm. agronomy, and data management, let's say. Okay. Mm -hmm. Today, when I do the same map, I have at least 10 different tools, including machine learning, uh, high throughput phenotyping, um, sensory analysis, phytochemistry, all, and so it's a whole a bunch mm -hmm. of uh, tools that we have in our hand, and then and then the strategy and as a strategist, you have to define the roadmap on how you can implement them in your in a given breeding program, taking in consideration the biology of the plant because the answer or the roadmap will not have the same speed if you are talking about a tomato or talking about a maple tree, for instance. Mm -hmm. But you, you have to use all these um, tools that you have in your hands uh, to make it faster, to make it more accurate, and always with the scope of having more um, resilience against uh, water uh, drought. Pest and disease, these are the main targets everywhere for every crop. <laughs> and to make, uh, and, and, and for some fruits or fruit tr for fruit vegetables, it's also how to store to avoid uh, waste as well. So the storage, the shelf life is very important. For cereal, you will have, um, in the context of reducing the, the, the spray of chemicals, you will have the issue of having, um, of maintaining the good standards of mycotoxins, for instance, because that's a big issue when you reduce the, the sprays of uh, against fungus, for instance, you have an increased uh, prevalence of uh, fungus, which can be very harmful for human health. So mm. that's where it's uh, very difficult. You, you have to be very careful. So these are all the topics that you have to consider. So you have your breeding target and you play, let's say, with the different tool that you have um, access to. And of course, every time you have to consider uh, the balance of uh, costs. And so mm -hmm. that's how you modulate and you make, uh, you can write uh, your uh, scientific roadmap to reach your goal. Mm -hmm. Sounds so easy when you say it. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Um, uh, maybe for I know we're, we're kind of reaching the end of our interview, but uh, as a as a final question, I I'm I was reminded when you when you were just talking about um, all the people that are involved in in this in the implementation of such a strategy, right? You have those tools, you analyze, you make a roadmap, but then on the roadmap there are quite a few people involved. The value chain is a complex thing, um, so I'm wondering. All the people that are involved, the deciders that are involved in this process, how how has maybe the acceptance or the the understanding of all these tools developed there? So any you know obviously uh, leaders of breeding programs, but also politicians, uh, people who who implement programs on site uh, um, that support sustainability. Um, do you see see a change there? Also, an awareness of the options that are there. Uh I think that uh, the awareness is getting higher and higher, to be honest. I, I Maybe I'm too optimistic, but I have the feeling that I, at a certain level of decision makers, uh, they have understood you know, that uh, the, it's urgent, uh, the, 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 the situation is difficult. Um, also, at former level, because I, I am also working with uh, co-ops here in France uh, those days, uh, I, uh, helping them to, to change their um, growing models for a more sustainable way. And I, I'm really um, positively surprised to see that um, the, the global awareness is raising, really. So that's a good point. And they really want to change, but most of the time they do not know how to change. And that's where, as agronomists, we all have uh, a role to play uh, to facilitate, to help farmers, to help uh, consumers to understand as well. Mm -hmm. uh, because you can help farmers to change their uh, growing systems, but you also have to aware uh, the final consumer when they have to, to choose in a supermarket. Mm -hmm. uh, what is more sustainable to another? 
most of so most of the time is not as simple as it is local no it's sometimes it's a little bit more complex than that it's which kind of inputs they have used uh how it was grown uh water use efficiency all these topics are getting sometimes water use efficiency is much more important than uh, did i spray with a chemical to avoid this and that so it's not mm. it's always uh, so that's where and i see uh, the tool are getting more and more uh, sharper and sharper uh, to to make this life life cycle assessment. Mm -hmm. So that's also where because it's a tool to help decision maker to help final consumer to make a decision. So that's also a good point, I would say. There are still things to be done, but that's that's it. Uh, so yeah, maybe again, maybe I'm too optimistic, but I have the feeling that at a certain level of decision maker, the the awareness is high. At the production level, also the decision, the the the, the, the awareness is there, but most of the time they simply do not know how to change their habits. So we have to provide them solutions and easy to use solution and not expensive solution. Mm -hmm. And at the end, at the final consumer level, um, it's hard because also in this inflation moments that we are uh, living right now, it's quite hard to say to the the population that okay. Maybe you will have to pay uh, fifty percent more. Exp Maybe your tomato will be five percent more expensive. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, you have to eat uh, fruit and vegetable uh, every day. So let's. So and at the same time, you will increase your uh, bill for gas and, mm -hmm. and eating system. So that's quite hard. Um, so it's a. a a frugal, I think that the awareness at the final consumer is to realize that uh, food is something precious mm. uh, and uh, something precious, you, it has to be uh, maybe um, the price can be valued and we have to reduce the waste. And then for a certain portion of the population, maybe uh, pay more, but we cannot say this thing to everybody it's just not possible mm. certainly a challenge but i i love that you combine it with with an optimistic note uh, to yeah I, I think it doesn't help to to be pessimistic we have to no. we have to i guess work with the challenge at hand and and like you said we do have awareness has increased we have better tools yeah. and now we we just maybe need to invest a little more into educating into getting the tools into the right hands and and hopefully you know work on various places in the chain to Absolutely. to improve the situation and also and, and also something that is quite uh, positive to my to my eyes is that uh, the youth is also pushing mm -hmm. a lot on these topics and that's very nice because that's these are the ones that are teaching us mm -hmm. and, and that's nice. Uh, I, I, I see the, the kids today uh, are getting more and more concerned about uh, recycling, uh, uh, not uh, wasting food. Uh, so that's also uh, a, big, um, a big part of the awareness, don't, do you, don't you think? Oh yeah, for sure, for sure. That's why I think you're right, we have reasons to be, you know, to, we have to, we, we are looking at a huge, a humongous challenge, but there's also at least some reasons to be optimistic. Yeah, and, 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 and also a very positive point, which is uh, trade to a certain point, but okay, when, when you have the market that push good practices, it's nice, <laughs> you know, there mm -hmm. is no, no problem, no issue about that. But there is also the emerging, or a little bit more than emerging, but the market for carbon, Mm -hmm. And the only uh, industrial sector that can capture carbon is agriculture. So that's also why I'm, I'm also, uh, it's a part of my optimism is that um, there is a lot of money invested on that, on uh, understanding how agriculture can sequest carbon. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is a good amount of money in R&D uh, mm -hmm. invested to find solutions on how crop soil can help us to reach our target in carbon sequestration. 
For sure. I feel like um, we almost have to do another episode, maybe next season, if you if you were willing to come back uh, to just okay. talk about that aspect. Um, Good idea. <laughs> thank you so much, Anne, for your for your time, for your insights. I think we learned a lot about uh, generally the topic, but especially on on how to increase sustainability um, in in agricultural practices and agronomy, um, how to how to also look at different aspects of the value chain and and go in there and also that we tech has improved that we do have more tools more precise tools um, that should should help us deal with that challenge and maybe allow us to be optimistic so thank you for your time you're welcome and to our listeners out there thank you for listening for being with us today we hope you will be back feel free to uh, to check out our website at computomics.com you can see all the previous episodes And obviously, if you like what you heard, uh, feel free to hit the follow and hear you next time. Bye.